What's going on guys? This is Rob and everything over the course of this video is going to be ridiculously important even though it seems like it might not be, right? So what this does, picking up off the last video that we did, what this does is this initially opens with basically the Maloids showing up to the surface world. Now for those of you guys who don't know, Maloids are basically subterranean dwellers and depending on what story you're reading, they serve different purposes. Here in the main Marvel Universe, they're ruled by Mole Man. He's kind of like their, their overarching guy. He's not overly important. He's actually the first villain, the fan Fantastic Four fought in the history of Marvel Comics, but it's one of these things where when he arrives here on the scene, it's not to spark a fight with the Fantastic Four. Instead, it's here to actually ask them for help. And the reason why is because somewhere along the line over the course of his history, the High Evolutionary had created a city for himself. Now, we're going to see him in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, right? He's coming up. But the thing behind this is that Herbert Wyndham is a guy who is obsessed with jumpstarting the evolution of various things. But somewhere along the line prior to this, he had built a city below New York. And the intention was to basically demonstrate to kind of the scientific community that he was able to manipulate the evolutionary structure of various beings. And then when the city was ready, when the Ascension engine was prepared, that the city would basically rise up and by virtue of the Ascension engine would basically kind of activate or jumpstart the evolutionary state of beings across the world. In essence, it would push humanity to its next evolutionary state. The thing behind this is that ultimately it was a Abandoned. that what had happened is when the ascension engine was activated it didn't evolve anything it actually devolved beings right it sent them back to an earlier state in their evolution and so the result of this is that ultimately uh herbert Wyndham, the high evolutionary was kind of forced out of his own city he essentially took off right they literally ran him out of town and the result is that he ended up taking up residence in wonder gore mountain and has basically been there ever since the concern that mole man has is because of the intelligence of reed richards he's seemingly the only one that can stop the city from serving and prevent the ascension engine from activating and basically kind of devolving the entirety of humanity. And so what ends up happening is a Fantastic Four basically transition to the subterranean realm with Mole Man. Now, some of the things here are kind of interesting and kind of cool, right? Geodes and stuff like that. It's one of the things to know about the Maloids. They exist all over the world, but there is a specific tribe that basically holds its allegiance to Mole Man, right? So it's kind of a series of fractured kingdoms, if you want to call it that. It's kind of a primitive depiction of how how they operate but there are all these different things that have been built now the funny thing about this is that jonathan hickman actually went into detail on some of this stuff in his shield mini series which actually took him years to finish but he went into detail with that stuff which we can cover if you guys are interested but once they actually get to the city of the high evolutionary one of the things that they realize is that first and foremost when it comes to the maloids and in terms of them being affected by the city that while it devolved them physically it evolved them mentally and so so basically they're smarter than they used to be but when they devolved they actually devolved more to a humanoid state which is kind of interesting because you would expect it to be the inverse right they would evolve to look more like humans as opposed to the other way around but once they're in there and they start to realize there's not much they can do to actually stop the city from moving to the surface although they can find a way to deactivate the ascension engine that what ends up happening is ben Grimm basically leaps out of the ship and heads into the city itself now a lot of this is kind of an ongoing theme and it's not something that Hickman directly hits on is more inferring based on Ben Grimm's history. But one of the things to know is that ever since Ben Grimm became the thing, he's always kind of been looking for a way to get back to his human form. And the logic that Ben Grimm has, even if he doesn't necessarily speak it openly, is that if the Ascension engine physically devolved the Maloids to where they looked more humanoid in nature, but it basically evolved their intelligence, it could do the same thing to Ben Grimm. It could send him back into his human form, but also make him smarter. And that's literally what he's shooting for here. Now, as he's in there, he is exposed to the radiation of the Ascension engine. And it's why the Fantastic Four themselves don't immediately jump out because they need some kind of protection from that. So that's why you see Ben Grimm's physical appearance change, like his brain or his head gets bigger. But the important thing here is he is able to rescue a couple of the Maloid children who haven't evolved yet. They still maintain their previous form. But of course, Ben Grimm ends up getting back onto the vessel and then they basically leave. And because there's no way to stop the rising of the city, the city does come to the surface. So the thing about this is we transition to a presentation that's kind of given to the Fantastic Four by Susan Storm. And what we end up learning is that at some previous point in time, there ended up being something that was discovered called Vostok Station. And that it initially belonged to the Russians, but that basically it's being used as kind of a research post. 
suggests that there are scientists at the moment who are studying it based on a grant that was given by the Fantastic Four Foundation. Now, there is something called the Future Foundation. That's something that we'll explore probably here in the next couple of weeks. Uh, that's when that'll become relevant because the Future Foundation is just really, really cool. But the thing about this is that Susan Storm actually realizes that there, or at least kind of tells the Fantastic Four, that no one specifically knows what's down there, but whatever it is that's down there is, of course, worth exploring and worth looking into. But where the Fantastic Four are funding this based on their kind of scientific curiosity, Advanced Idea Mechanics is likely looking to try to weaponize it. And what Advanced Idea Mechanics has been doing is about five miles away from where the Fantastic Four station is set up. The Advanced Idea Mechanics is basically slant drilling, so drilling at an angle to try to reach whatever's below Vostok Station before uh, the Fantastic Four can get there. And so ultimately, the Fantastic Four is kind of like, let's go exploring. <laughs> so they end up basically kind of diving down there and checking it out. Of course, they're kind of given a few warnings here and there based on the staff. And it's kind of like, look, you know, there's a few things you need to be concerned of and so on. But the reality here is the Fantastic Four is a team that's explored the multiverse. So checking out just kind of a giant sort of heat structure kind of in the in the Antarctic, which seemingly isn't supposed to be there, uh, it's not a big deal, right? It's not a huge issue for them. And so once they get down there, they actually end up arriving at the same time as Advanced Idea Mechanics. And that's when a kind of fight breaks out, not really between the Fantastic Four and AIM, but the actual occupants of what's below Vostok Station. And that's when you end up having this kind of truce that's formed, because where Advanced Idea Mechanics is nefarious here, the Fantastic Four join these forces to basically defeat AIM. And when that happens, the AIM guys are just kind of, they're taken out of the picture, and the Fantastic Four are brought to this race's leader, essentially. And that's when things get interesting. Now, something to know here is, in in order to understand what we're getting ready to talk about next, you kind of have to understand the nature of the history of Marvel Comics. So I'll make sense of it as we go through the in-universe history of Earth and all that kind of stuff, because the reality here is that the individuals that house this area that where, where Vostok Station is based, these are basically Atlanteans, but they're not Atlanteans as you know them. They're not ruled by Namor the Submariner. Now, the Fantastic Four are basically given these kind of telepathic objects that allow them to communicate with this race because they don't speak the same language. And the truth is just trying to learn how to speak their language would take too long if the human race was even capable of doing it at all. But the funny thing here is that when the Fantastic Four get to these guys, they say like, we're Atlanteans and this is Atlantis. And their response is, no, that doesn't make any sense. Atlantis is destroyed. Now, this is where we start getting into the history of things. For those of you guys who are familiar with Jonathan Hickman's Avengers and New Avengers, you know that Atlantis, as we for the most part know it, and really the Atlanteans themselves were almost completely and totally annihilated by the Wakandans in response to Namor the Submariner during the events of Avengers vs. X-Men attacking Wakanda and killing countless Wakandans. What Reed Richards is talking about here is a story that took place in Marvel in the mid-1990s, which was called Atlantis Rising, and it was literally where Atlantis was brought to the surface by Morgan Le Fay, which resulted in the deaths of a multitude of Atlanteans itself. But the bigger picture here, and the reason why these guys are even here in the first place, and is something that's not readily explained here by Jonathan Hickman is that when it comes to the Atlanteans, their roots go all the way back to the Celestials. So the way this worked is that at a previous point in time, Atlantis was a trading hub for the world, right? Literally Atlantis was an island that could be accessed by the surface and a lot of people just went there, right? People from all over the world would meet in Atlantis, they would trade goods, services, different things like that. When the Celestials showed up a second time during the second host to basically examine their experiment of creating the Deviants and the Eternals, that the Deviants attacked the Celestials. And in doing so, the Celestials initiated the Great Cataclysm, which sunk the city of Atlantis. What ended up happening here is that those individuals who survived, most of them ended up taking residence in the city of Atlantis itself, in the island of Atlantis, even though it had been sunk. And there were magics that were used that allowed them to breathe underwater. There was some genetic modification and so on and so forth. And that's how you basically end up with the Atlanteans as you know them, people with blue skin who live underwater. What also happened here is there were some individuals who took off to other parts of the world. And that basically led to their own individual Atlantean kingdoms being formed, but they operated in secret. Nobody ever knew they were there because Vostok Station, right? This entire citadel basically where these Atlanteans reside is essentially cut off from the rest of the world. This is something that will be explored later on down the line because Namor will learn of their existence. And the real question you have to ask is when Namor learns that these other Atlanteans exist out there, 
what happens? But the kicker here, and the reason why this little bit of a story matters is because it does build into that. We do need this so we can understand that. But what also happens is that when it comes to this Atlantean group, they have individual kingdoms, but they only ever speak as a singular person, meaning one individual represents them, right? So it's like the ambassador of the United States going to other parts of the world. And that's why when you have Reed and you have Susan and you have Ben Grimm and you have Johnny and they like fought against advanced idea mechanics, these Atlanteans don't understand that. To them, it's strange because they're like, we have different kingdoms, sure, but we are a unified collective. And in times when the kingdom needs to be spoken for, only one of us speaks for them. And the response of Reed is, that's not how we do things, right? Each individual person has a collective voice. The point of this is that Susan Storm is kind of appointed or really allowed to step into the role of what's basically the speaker for humanity. Now she does this for a couple different reasons. The first of these is that Susan Storm is level-headed. The other reason why Susan Storm is taking this role is because she knows a time will come when Namor the Submariner will become aware of them. And Namor's always been trying to bang Susan Storm. And depending on who you talk to, man, they kind of have a couple of times. It's never overly stated by Marvel, not that I'm aware of, but it's one of those things where like, I, you know, they, they may have touched naughty bits, but that's the reason why she undertakes this role. But continuing on, right? Cause again, this video is really more of kind of like, Hey, this is setting the stage for stuff. We end up switching over to the inhumans right now. Normally we don't care about the inhumans. The inhumans suck. They never really serve a useful purpose. This is going to be cool. And in fact, it's one of like three times in the history of Marvel comics when the inhumans are ever cool at all. But what we end up doing is basically switching over to the inhumans as they take off to leave earth to confront the Kree. Now this is Jonathan Hickman writing this story during the time when Dan Abnett in Marvel Comics is taking care of all the spacefaring stuff, right? The reason why that matters is because during this point in time, Black Bolt of the Inhumans traveled to the Kree homeworld of Hala and challenged Ron and the Accuser, who was the existing ruler of the Kree race, for control of the Kree. He ends up winning, and then that leads into the War of Kings when you have Vulcan, the Omega-level brother of Cyclops, who faces off against uh, Black Bolt, and then of course it leads to like the Cancerverse storyline, Thanos Imperative, all that kind of stuff. So it's one of those really, really cool tidbits here. But the reality is that in response to Black Bolt's absence, what you do have is a guy who's kind of a uh, kind of a, a steward of the inhuman city or the inhuman government, if you want to call it that. But when the Fantastic Four get there, they're ultimately met by this guy who's referred to as Dal Damak. Now this guy's going to be very important later on down the line, but he simply refers to this giant ship that is essentially touched down on the blue area of the moon as the universal city. Now the blue area of the moon was originally created by the Kree. It was basically a section of the moon that was given oxygen so the Kree could operate there. And that's really what's explained here. That we kind of get this explanation regarding the history of the Inhumans in Marvel Comics, where Reed Richards is aware of the fact that they were created by the Kree, but he doesn't know how far reaching it is. And what we're told here is that the Kree Supreme Intelligence's public explanation to everybody out there regarding the creation of the Inhumans is to basically kind of weaponize them to a degree, right? That if the Kree race wants to be able to subdue and subvert other empires across the universe, the best way to do that is to genetically modify members of that race so that at some future point in time, they can undergo exposure to terrogenesis and they will in turn be activated. They'll realize that they're Kree insurgents and they can in turn just kind of operate within those kingdoms and bring it down from the inside. So think of it as like the Kree equivalent of Marvel's secret invasion. Scrolls secretly infiltrating Earth with the intention of destroying everybody there and then taking the planet for themselves. That's really what it was. And it's a really cool concept. The thing about this is that what we're told is that as far as the people on earth are concerned, the Fantastic Four and those guys, the Inhumans on earth are the only Inhumans. But the, the Supreme Intelligence had done this across the universe. So you have all these different Inhuman groups that had been created. Now, here's something that's explained later on, but we're gonna go ahead and cover it here, that there came a prophecy that the Supreme Intelligence became aware of, which basically meant the Inhuman project would lead to the destruction of the Kree. This prophecy came to fruition when Black Bolt travels to Kree space, challenges Ron and the Accuser, and then takes over the Kree kingdom. The reason why this matters is because in response to that prophecy, the Supreme Intelligence ordered the destruction of the Inhuman project. So basically, all Inhumans across the universe were annihilated, except for the four Inhuman tribes that we're going to be seeing here. And so it's cool, because when this revelation is given to Reed, what he's told is that because because they are what's left of the Inhumans across the universe, that instead of kind of operating as individual tribes, they 
had unified. They had basically come together. And so what you have are called the Universal Inhumans, and they exist in four different groups. The first one are the Centaurian family, right? So like the royal family, which is led by their matriarch, Ula Undanta, who you guys remember the Centaurians basically from like Guardians of the Galaxy, the movie. But then you also have the ruling Mord Council, which is presided over by the Badoon Queen and has a name that I can't pronounce. But following this, you also have the Chameleons. Now the Chameleons are not new to the Fantastic Four. And in fact, the White Mane family, which was a, which was a member of the Chameleon race, actually has had dealings with the Fantastic Four and they've been a part of Power Pack, which is really, really cool, but they're not unfamiliar with them. But following that, you also have the goddess Avo, who basically rules the Dire Race. Now the Dire Race are really, really cool. They're very, very powerful, but they're also very dangerous. But the thing about this and what's really established here is that regardless of what allegiances their races may have had in the past, regardless of what role they play, the reality here is they're unified under the basis of inhumanity. Now, one thing that I want to explain here, none of these groups have seemingly undergone their race's version of Terragenesis. They still look like the races they're supposed to look like. Once they undergo whatever their Terragenesis process is, then they'll look totally different. The reality here, and really what Dal Domac basically says is that for them, when Black Bolt returns, because Black Bolt is kind of the inhuman, right? Like the guy who was prophesized to lead the, the universal inhumans themselves to kind of form a, a house of six, that what's going to take place here is that he's going to be the one to lead them, right? And they're going to essentially find a new home for themselves. Now, of course, the question of the Fantastic Four is when this time comes, what's this new home going to be? And they're like, Earth. We're gonna invade your world. <laughs> the thing about this though, is that it's still an opportunity for diplomacy. But one thing to also remember here, and the reason why Reed Richards doesn't really order the Fantastic Four to immediately attack is lest we forget, Reed Richards and Black Bolt are both members of the Illuminati. So this is one of those things that can kind of be solved behind closed doors. So there's no need for war yet because diplomacy is still an opportunity. It's still something that can be done. But following this, we end up switching over to Johnny Storm. What this does is it introduces something called the Cult of the Negative Zone. Now they will become incredibly important later on down the line. But for Johnny Storm, all that really happens is he ends up like meeting this girl at the club who's like super hot. And so he ends up taking her back to the Baxter building because as anybody who reads the Fantastic Four knows, it's kind of Johnny Storm's thing where he's like, I'm a member of the Fantastic Four. And like, they're all, they're like he's already got him hooked based on that. And he's like, let me show you the Baxter building, which gets them even more hooked. And then he's like, let me show you the view. And before you know it, they're touching naughty bits. And so the thing behind this <laughs> is that once this girl gets up there from Johnny's perspective, it's business as usual. But the thing about this is that this girl is not all she seems to be because the reality is the cult of the negative zone operates out of a nightclub called the other side of zero. And what they're doing is they're positioning themselves in such a way to where they can access the negative zone. But the truth about this is that this girl is basically a host for a member of the annihilation wave, which is referred to you as an enthrosion. But the importance behind this is that the negative zone houses basically a whole universe. Like just, it's massive in scale, right? So in the multiverse and Marvel comics, you've got an infinite number of universes, some of which are similar and some of which are drastically different. In the entirety of the multiverse, you only have one negative zone. And that houses beings like Annihilus, who basically invaded the main Marvel universe during the Annihilation storyline, just different things like that, right? But it's a, a huge place that's just got all kinds of life teeming in it. The reality is that that with this girl being a host for one of the Anthrosians, for a member of the Annihilation Wave, that what happens is it basically kind of emerges from her back in a pretty gruesome way, right? It's pretty twisted, but basically has a bomb strapped on it. Now this girl under the influence of the, uh, of the, the Anthrosian had opened the portal to the negative zone. It wasn't for the purpose of like allowing the entire Annihilation Wave through, right? Like that army of billions of bugs, basically. That's not really what it was for. Instead, it was to gain access to the negative zone. And when Johnny Storm follows it through, right? He basically tells Herbie the robot, like keep the portal open for five minutes, I'll be back. If five minutes passes and I haven't returned, close the portal and I'll find some other way to get back in here. But the reality is that once he gets to the other side, what he, what he ends up realizing is the entirety of the negative zone is in a state of kind of civil war, where you've basically got the forces of black star who's one of the individuals that exists in the negative zone leading his whole army who's gone to war with Annihilus. and what's going on here is that these two guys waging war against each other is leading to like world 
after world kind of falling and being assaulted and so on and so forth. So think of it like a universe wide war where you basically have the forces of Annihilus against everybody else. When Johnny Storm gets in there, what he realizes is that Enthrosion had actually brought a bomb with it. And the entire purpose was for the cult of the negative zone to allow one of those Enthrosions to enter into the positive matter universe, into the main Marvel universe, grab a bomb and then get back to the negative zone again. But because the Fantastic Four, the Baxter building is the only real way in and out of the negative zone, unless somebody else somewhere happens to open a portal, it's the safest surefire way to get back and forth from that location. So that's why it ended up posing as that girl to get access to the, the portal to the negative zone in the first place. Once it gets in there, it detonates the bomb and it basically kills the leadership on that world. And Johnny Storm has no choice but to flee back to the positive matter universe. Now, the reason why that matters and one of the cool things that you learn from this is that within the negative zone, one of the things that had happened is they had basically repurposed Prison 42, which was a prison that was created by Reed Richards during Civil War, which is where they housed those individuals who refused to register. Ultimately, Prison 42 was abandoned, right? Nobody really uses it anymore, but it's been repurposed by the forces of the negative zone and turned into a giant expansive city. But once, uh, once Johnny gets back to the positive matter universe, he ends up meeting with Reed Richards. Now, this sets the stage for Johnny's moment. So this is ridiculously important and we're going to reflect back on this. But there comes a point when Reed sits down with Johnny and is like, hey man, we need to talk. And Johnny's like, okay, what's going on? And, and Reed just kind of looks at him and is like, what's the deal here? And that's when Johnny's like, yeah, I don't know what I was thinking, man. Like, honestly, leaving the negative zone portal open like that, the entire annihilation wave could have just entered in, right? We could have been facing annihilation all over again, the annihilation event, and they would have invaded Earth. I could have gotten everybody killed, right? He could have gotten like Franklin killed. He could have gotten Valeria killed. He could have gotten everybody killed, right? Earth itself could have been completely and totally overtaken because Johnny was being reckless and Johnny wasn't thinking. And that's Reed's response here is, look, man, here's the deal, right? Like things are changing. The world's changing. And the reality here is we all have something going on. Susan Storm is now an emissary for a newly discovered race of Atlanteans that exist out there. And there's going to be some kind of a conflict that's likely going to unfold with name of the Submariner. So we have to be prepared for that. I've got stuff going on that I can't even tell you about, which of course he's referring to the Council of Reeds. And so it's like, everybody has stuff going on, man. So here's the question you have to ask yourself, Johnny, like, what do you stand for, right? We all stand for something. And so as the last little tidbit here, and this group's going to become important, what ends up going on is back at the Universal and Human City that as a kind of show of their power, kind of a display of their power, it's sort of a blood sacrifice or an offering if you want to give it that, that what ends up happening is the Universal and Humans end up creating a group called the Light Brigade, which is basically a coming together of their most capable warriors, which is designed to basically show the Inhumans once Black Bolt arrives, we're worth your time and effort, right? We're worth your attention. We can bring something to the table. And to kind of demonstrate the power of the Light Brigade, what they end up doing is sending them into the negative zone. The idea here being, if they can face off against the forces of Annihilus, and if they can be successful and come back alive, then it will prove their mettle, right? So it's kind of like a, a warrior's tribute. It's a, a way to demonstrate their capabilities, right? Like this, this, that kind of a thing, right? Building up character and whatnot, but they will become important later. I promise you they will. But with that being said, guys, we're going to bring this video to an end. Thank you all for watching and I will catch you all later. Peace.